to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 869 for May 3rd, 2021. Coming up in a few minutes. We were expecting just mid 1800s, somewhere in the Civil War era, just to show that it wasn't modern junk in an old bottle that somebody corked up and made up a whole story. And the results came back, and it was, it was kind of mind blowing. Sometimes whiskey appraisers get their estimates off by a few years. In this case, Skinner's Joe Hyman may have been off by 50 years or more. On the older side, he estimated that a bottle of Old Ingledew bourbon might date back to around 1850, just before the Civil War. But carbon dating found otherwise, try the late 1700s, around the Revolutionary War. That could make it the world's oldest known bottle of whiskey. That bottle will go up for auction next month. Joe Hyman joins me later on Whiskey Cast in depth with the story behind that bottle, which in itself makes the bottle valuable as a historical artifact, even if the whiskey had been made around 1850. I'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, May's Whiskey Club of the Month, and on Behind the Label, it is somehow reassuring to think of the spirit of Scotland gently maturing in casks, oblivious to the ebb and flow of world events, waiting patiently to be shared and enjoyed in happier days. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Small batch. How would you describe it? It's like... An Irishman's understanding of baseball. Extremely limited. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. After 175 years in business, Dewar's could rest on its laurels. But we've always believed in staying curious, which brings us to Portuguese Smooth, the brainchild of our award-winning master blender, Stephanie McLeod. Portuguese Smooth is a high-quality blended scotch finished in real ruby port barrels for a taste like no other. Let's get started with the week's news. We reported back in early March on the sale of Conor McGregor's proper number 12 Irish whiskey brand to Beckley. That deal has now been completed, and Beckley provided more details about its acquisition of McGregor's Ireborn Spirits, during its first quarter earnings report. The Mexico-based holding company for the Beckman family's spirits interests originally indicated that it would be buying the remaining 51% of the company that it didn't already own. However, McGregor will be holding on to a small piece of the company, along with his partners Audi Attar and Ken Austin. As for the $600 million total price for the brand that's been reported by other media outlets, not even close. And we have the receipts, so to speak. Beckley Chief Financial Officer Fernando Suarez Gerard gave the actual price during the company's conference call with analysts. Regarding Erie Born Spirits, on April 23rd of this year, the company completed the exercise of its option to acquire additional equity interest in such entity in a transaction amount of $169 million, reflecting a total aggregate cash investment in EBS of $244 million. Mr. Conor McGregor will remain actively engaged in the promotion of the proper number 12 brand. That $600 million figure came from Ken Austin in a Shankin News Daily story, and it could well reflect the founders' expected ongoing share of profits from future sales. That has been a common part of other acquisitions involving celebrity-owned spirits brands. I should note that Beckley executives declined our requests for an interview. In other news, we are starting to see the reopening of pubs in Scotland following the long coronavirus lockdown. It's nowhere near normal quite yet, 
But Rosalind Erskine of The Scotsman told us on Friday night's Happy Hour Live webcast that Scots are taking advantage of the relaxed rules. Finally, it's been a long winter. <laughs> yeah, so we our pubs opened um, on Monday the 26th and it's um, alcohol only outside, uh, which is you think would be fine given the fact it's late April, but it's it's pretty cold. It's not as warm as it was this time last year. Um, you can you can go inside for a meal, but you can't have alcohol. So there's been a lot of people in the rain, in their jumpers, uh, drinking pints. <laughs> Indoor alcohol service at Scotland's pubs is tentatively set to resume on May 17th. More distilleries will also start to offer tastings at their visitors' centre starting that week. That includes the brand new visitor center at Ben Riach Distillery, which opens on May 21st. The Speyside Distillery never had an official visitor's center before, and this is part of Brown Foreman's plans to invest in the distillery. Tastings will have to be booked in advance and will only be available for now Fridays through Sundays. Tours of the distillery will not be available until more public health restrictions are relaxed in Scotland. Gordon and MacPhail is the latest Scotch whiskey company to take advantage of the new relaxed U.S. rules that allow European-size 700-milliliter bottles. And the company is starting with a big one. It's a 67-year-old Glen Grant single malt that kicks off Gordon and MacPhail's new legacy series of bottlings, And this one will honor Mr. George. George Urquhart led the family-owned company's second generation and is regarded as the father of single malt scotch. The first fill sherry butt was filled on Christmas Eve 1953 and bottled on January 5th of this year at 59.4% ABV. 355 bottles will be available, with 30 coming to the U.S. in 700 ml bottles for the first time. The U.S. recommended retail price is $7,500 a bottle. Pricing will vary in other markets. Meanwhile, Irish Distillers has launched the second release in its Middleton Very Rare Silent Distillery Collection. It's a 46-year-old single pot still whiskey distilled at the original Middleton Distillery in 1973. That distillery closed two years later when the current Middleton Distillery opened. Only 70 bottles will be available in Ireland, the UK, the US, France, and global travel retail. The price? €40,000 or $45,000 each. Jim McEwen has retired a couple of times over the past few years, but he swears it's for good this time. The Isle of Legend has decided that after 58 years of making whiskey, he's ready now to become a full-time husband and grandfather. There is one final public event for Jim, though. His friends at Drampool, the Water of Life movie, and the German publisher of his new memoir, A Journeyman's Journey, are hosting a farewell online chat with Jim May 23rd. Tasting kits are available, with the proceeds to support Scotland's charity air ambulance service. We have a link for details in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. One of the annual highlights of the Kentucky Bourbon Festival has been the induction of new members into the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame. There's word now that this year's induction ceremony has been canceled for the second straight year because of the pandemic, even though the Bourbon Festival itself is still scheduled to take place in mid-September. The Kentucky Distillers Association said even while COVID vaccination rates are rising and cases are declining in Kentucky, board members did not want to take a chance of endangering attendees They'll wait until next year to hold a proper in-person ceremony. And finally, if you've listened to Whiskey Cast for a long time, you have probably heard from Gable Arenzo. He was instrumental in bringing New York's Tuthill Town spirits to the forefront of craft distilling, along with his father Ralph and Brian Lee. Gable was a source of information and guidance for fledgling distillers, both at Tuttletown 
and his own Gardner Liquid Mercantile Brandy Distillery, which he founded in 2015 after leaving Tuttletown. But there is far more to Gable's life than just spirits. He and his wife, Kathy, opened their home to a dozen foster children over the years, adopted one of them, and were working on the adoption process for a second child when Gable died in his sleep last Monday at the age of 41. He crammed more life into those years than most of us will ever do in twice as long, and he will be missed. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. Join us every Friday night at 5 p.m. New York time for our Happy Hour Live webcast. That's 10 p.m. London time, 2100 GMT elsewhere in the world. You can watch the fun on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Twitch. If you missed our latest Writers' Roundtable this past Friday with Rosalind Durskin of The Scotsman, Moa Nilsson, the Swedish Whiskey Girl, and author Kurt Maitland, the on-demand replay is available at the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. The Spirit of Toronto's Discovery Series of Virtual Tastings continues this week with Buffalo Trace's Harlan Wheatley on Wednesday night, Highland Park's Cameron Miller Thursday night, Hiram Walker's Dr. Don Livermore Friday night, Oliver Chilton of Elixir Distillers on Saturday, and George Grant of Glen Farkless on Sunday. The Our Whiskey Virtual Festival continues on Thursday night with Club Tropicana, featuring a range of whiskeys with fruity flavors. The Whiskey Exchange has a Brook Laddie and Port Charlotte virtual tasting that same night. McTeers has its next whiskey auction Friday in Glasgow, Scotland, and Art Begg's Monsters of Smoke bus tour has stops in Las Vegas and Atlanta this week. Finally, the Whiskey Show Sydney is still on for May 14th and 15th in Sydney, Australia. Right now, we have 148 virtual and live whiskey events around the world on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. Of course, live events are still subject to change on short notice, depending on pandemic-related local health restrictions, so make sure you check with event organizers before you make any travel plans. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, three continents, and online. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. After 175 years in business, Dewar's could rest on its laurels. But we've always believed in staying curious and pushing boundaries. Which brings us to Portuguese Smooth, the brainchild of our award-winning master blender, Stephanie McLeod. Port Smooth is a quality blend of eight-year-old scotch finished in real ruby port barrels for a rich, complex spirit with notes of red cherries, creamy vanilla, and honeydew melon. It's like no other scotch on the market, and you can find it right now at a store near you. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Oban and the entire Classic Malts lineup. This week we are looking at a whiskey mystery, an old bottle of whiskey that might have had some historical value just for the people who once owned it, one of the world's great financiers, and a former Supreme Court justice who went on to become Secretary of State, and later the Governor of South Carolina. James Burns received the bottle during World War II while serving as Secretary of War Mobilization under President Franklin D. Roosevelt. We know that much because he gave it to Francis Drake while serving as governor in South Carolina in the early 50s. Drake was a good friend, and his descendants have held on to that bottle ever since. And there's a typed note taped to the bottle noting that it came from the collection of J.P. Morgan. 
like a lot of vintage whiskey bottles in recent years, it wound up with Joe Hyman at Skinner Auctioneers. He sent off a sample of the whiskey for analysis by Dr. Alexander Cherkinsky at the University of Georgia. And the results were analyzed by Dr. Gordon Cook at the University of Glasgow. He is arguably the world's leading expert in using carbon dating to find the age of a whiskey. They both agreed that this is not just an authentic old bottle of whiskey, but was distilled sometime between 1760 and 1803. That would make it the oldest known bottle of whiskey that has survived to this day. The bottle will go on the auction block next month at Skinner's, and Joe Hyman told me the story behind it on a somewhat noisy Zoom call. In the middle of the pandemic last summer, I, I came into my office. I wasn't spending a lot of time, you know, we weren't spending a lot of time in the office because of the lockdown and everything. We were allowed because alcohol is, a, a, I guess, a necessary item, especially in a pandemic. So uh, we were allowed to go to work. Um, even so, we're only allowed, let's say, 10% of our, our workforce in the building at any given point. So I was limiting my time there, and I popped in there and checked my mailbox, and there was a letter from the family with an article that, that had been written in the South Carolina magazine from a couple of years ago. And, wow, this is a pretty cool story. And I followed it up, and uh, because of the lockdown and uh, travel limitations, and et cetera, it was uh, extremely difficult to uh, to get the bottle in, and I certainly wasn't going to suggest to a guy that possibly a priceless bottle be just you know ship it up to us. So uh, we we needed to wait until things loosened up enough that our own transportation people uh, on on a road trip could uh, could pick it up and bring it back. And uh, three months ago, four months ago or so, uh, that's when you know we really started the ball rolling in earnest. What do we know that we know about? There's other things we don't know for sure, but what do we know? We know it was bottled in LaGrange, Georgia. It had made its way up to South Carolina at some point. That's where I got it from. The current owners have it for three generations. They handed it over with a gift card that they had gotten back three generations ago from James Burns, who had been the congressman and senator for South Carolina and a Supreme Court justice, um, been in the cabinet for FDR and Truman before going back to uh, South Carolina, becoming governor. And uh, he gave it to his good friend and neighbor with this... Uh, fantastical uh, backstory on it. And we've been piecing together information. I guess they've been doing it for uh, 50 years. They've been researching it. Documented back to the 1970s, they were contacting the mayor of, of LaGrange trying to figure out uh, exactly uh, where this distillery was. Turns out that, you know, when I was doing my, my own research uh, in conjunction with the Historical Society of LaGrange, that it wasn't a distillery at all. It was actually a, a basically a general store. Um, and they have archival information of newspaper advertisements, including we have fine liquors at Evans and Raglan. And they were active in the 1860s, 1870s. Um, we also have found from the University of Georgia archives court documents of Evans and Ragland suing the railroad company for ruining their shipment of corn. So, I mean, the whole thing keeps uh, morphing, I guess, and little bits and pieces keep adding up. We found an article also from the 70s in a magazine from Maryland discussing a particular collection that J.P. Morgan happened to come along and snap up all the whiskey, and the only thing left was a few bottles of Old Ingle Dew whiskey from LaGrange, Georgia. So it's been a fun ride uh, trying to figure out all this stuff. I mean, when the bottle came to us, and we were like, there's no capsule on it, and it's a pretty cool story. But, I mean, that's kind of where it ended. So, like, 
can we take a sample out and send it in for testing and see what uh, what transpires there? Because I mean, nobody's going to believe this whole this whole story. I mean, there's there was some documentation, and we have the gift card in in Burns' own hand, and he was he was basically the right hand man of uh, of FDR, and this family kind of revered him because he's about as big a celebrity that they probably ever met, and they were friendly with him, so uh, they cherished this bottle for three generations. And I uh, carefully took, uh, took the sample and sent it off to a lab. Lo and behold, a lab that I found that was willing to do a, a sample for me uh, was in the University of Georgia. So the whole thing kind of like tied a bow on itself. And uh, we were expecting just mid-1800s, somewhere in the Civil War era, just to show that it wasn't modern junk in an old bottle that somebody corked up and made up a whole story. and. The results came back, and it was, it was kind of mind blowing. Yeah, you know, how early it could be. What did they find? Because they used carbon dating, right? And then you had this uh, verified with uh, the guys at the University of Glasgow that have been doing this. In the carbon dating, there was also some carbon thirteen data, and I guess other carbon data. And I'm not I'm not a scientist, so I can't really interpret these kinds of things myself and uh, what the percentage is in, how things are weighted and statistics uh, and stuff like that. I have no idea how to interpret that stuff. And the guy who did the test at the University of Georgia was also a little apprehensive about going any further because, I mean, we figured 1850, 1860, something like that, you know, still, still under the premise that there was no distillery called Evans and Ragland after the war. So it must have been prior to the war. So, you know, maybe 1850s, 1860s, and came back with, uh, you know, all he would commit to was highest probability was roughly uh, 1760 to 1800. So I reached out to the University of Glasgow, who did testing for Whiskey 101 back a few years ago. And I said, would you mind taking a look at this data and like giving me your impressions on it? You know, I tried not to tell him anything about it specifically. Didn't come back at what we were expecting. And would you like to take a look at it, you know, given your your expertise and your interest in whiskey testing altogether? And he was like, sure, let's let's uh, let's take a look. And a couple hours later, he sent me back uh, the chart. It was 81 percent probability, 1763 to 1803, which really, really mind blowing. So I, I had a little bit of back and forth with him about, you know, what could skew the data? Could it have to do with old barrels? Could that any, anything from the char on the barrels have something to do with, with it? Could something, you know, some sort of external factor could weigh in on this? And he was like, not really. I mean, he has some sort of matrix calculations that he does to weigh all that stuff. I said, would the, the plus or minus that was originally, um, you know, mentioned by the by the other guy is that does that have any factor? And he says no. All that stuff is already built into the calculations that he made. So it's like whoa, <laughs> it's like you know, just talking about it gives me gives me goose goosebumps. What did you think when you saw that? 1763 number well i mean it's it's like this is a, it's like i don't know what did what did howard carter feel like when he opened up uh king tut's tomb um i mean in a way that's what i felt like that it was like finding finding an artifact that you know put into the context of of the era that it was um, you know, supposedly produced, then it's just like all things that were happening around that time. And it's just a fun experience to be involved with something like this. You had other data, though. Your research on Evans and Ragland shows that they were still in business 1860s, 1870s. Yeah. And the bottle is consistent with glass from that period, right? Yeah, I mean, 
I've seen as, as early as 1840 and I've seen as, as late as 1870 ish, you know, it's type of bottle with a, a blown in a cup mold type of uh, bottle. And it's hard to see in the pictures, but you can almost see how when they made the neck, there's some discoloring in the neck that when they twisted it to make the shape of the neck, you can see almost the discoloring in the neck as it swirls around it, which is pretty funky. Um, and it's got the flat uh, applied top, which is consistent with that period. Do we have any idea how J.P. Morgan got a hold of this in the first place? Well, interestingly enough, more information is coming out about that, too, where we found an article um, from Maryland, also in the 1970s, uh, discussing a historical site, which was a, a mansion from a wealthy family that uh, had this vast collection of wine and spirits back in the day. And apparently the, the previous archivist at this historical site had claimed that J.P. Morgan himself had come by and around the turn of the century and purchased most of the whiskey. All the Maryland were I and most of the other whiskey. And the only things that were left were a few bottles of Old Ingledew whiskey bottled by Evans and Raglan from LaGrange, Georgia. You know, it's coming more and more together. And, and um, somebody from that family actually recently uh, uh, reached out to me, saw some of the reports. Their family was actually from Georgia, and they moved from Georgia up to Maryland in the 1890s or so. And they supposedly were dealing with Evans and Ragland back before they moved. So whether they brought some with them, whether they were still distributing for them or, or something, I don't know how late Evans and Ragland was actually in business. I know that uh, John Ragland who was one of the principal partners, was named in court documents we found at the University of Georgia when they sued the railroad that ruined their corn shipment. And these court dates were 1873 to 1875. And the principals were Tom Evans and John Ragland. The archivist in LaGrange and I both had separately found obituaries for John Ragland, who had lived in Arkansas, of all places, for the last 40 years of his life. He was a Confederate war hero. And, yeah, it's just, uh, a lot of these things, just had more information is coming to light. It's putting pieces of the puzzle together even more. Now, you've said a couple of times, and I want to clarify this, that when Morgan visited that mansion in Maryland, the only things he left behind were a few bottles of Old Ingledew. Presumably, he took this bottle and a couple of others with him as part of that deal. Well, assuming that's where he got these, but again, with in discussions with the archivists down in LaGrange, Morgan and Roosevelt, who were third cousins on the Delano side of the family, they all had property down in that area, large estates. And, you know, whether he discovered the whiskey back in the 1860s, 1870s or something while visiting the area and then saw more of it when he was up in Maryland and got more of it, that we don't know. But the member of this family that was part of that historical site in Maryland is contacting the patriarch of the family, that side of the family, who's the uh, family historian, I guess, at this point to find out more about it, about what was going on down there. Has the Morgan family weighed in at all, J.P. Morgan and uh, Jack Morgan's descendants? I haven't heard anything from them. But, uh, you know, supposedly, uh, according to the article that was written back in 1978 about the bottle and the correspondence between the Drakes and the mayor of LaGrange, Reportedly, the mayor had offered to buy the bottle to repatriate back to LaGrange for display. And he had told him that one of the Morgans had approached him and offered him $3,000 for it back then. And 
he declined. Interesting. I wonder what the Morgan family, what the descendants would have to say today about this. They know where to reach you and me if they're interested. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we both have friends uh, near there, and we're working on trying to uh, get a peek of some of the seller uh, uh, books that are uh, still in the library down in the archives. Can you understand, even despite all this research, why some people might be just a little skeptical about this? Sure. I mean, you know, it's like from out of space, you know. Does anybody believe that aliens are visiting Earth and and kidnapping people to uh, probe them and whatnot? I mean, until there's really rock-solid, you know, smoking gun evidence, there's always going to be some sort of skeptics. Um, I mean, the fact that we, we have a letter from Burns in his own hand telling his pal that, It's a conversation piece. The enclosed gift is a conversation piece. Um, Reportedly, he typed out that card that's taped to the back of the bottle himself. And it just doesn't seem very likely that, you know, they made up the story 60 years ago and like have perpetuated all this time. Um, so I think that angle of it seems seems to be spot on. I mean, of course, we can't prove it unless you know either a Roosevelt or a Truman or a, a or a Burns will come back and said, "Oh, sure, we had we had that bottle." But um, or there's a record in the Morgan Library, for instance, in New York. Right. Uh, too well. I mean, this 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 newspaper article did indicate. I mean, this is going back uh, 45 years that that Morgan came along and bought all this stuff. So. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, I guess. I don't know. But, I mean, we're, we're still piecing it more and more together. And uh, hopefully in the next uh, couple of months, we'll have a lot, of, uh, a lot more information to, uh, to put out. So what do you think this is worth, realistically? I know that you put a uh, preliminary value right now of twenty to $40,000. But if this checks out, it could be literally priceless. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why I can't really put anything more than that. I mean, we just sold a bottle of OFC for 17. So what's, what's a bottle that's from, you know, the bottle itself is from 50 years earlier than that. So, uh, or, or 60. So what is a bottle from the mid 1800s worth? You know, and if you have the Morgan collection in the James Burns slash Truman and or Roosevelt connection adds something to it as well and, and creates more of a mystery and an allure and, and a whole mystique about it. I mean, so what number, how do you quantify that? You know, it's, it's something that can't be quantified until it actually happens. I have to ask the sample that you extracted is it drinkable? Well, Mama didn't raise no fool, and when when I capped off the needle after you know injecting it completely into the vial, I took it home with me and shook out the two drops or three drops that were left inside the needle onto my hand, and uh, it tasted like bourbon. The Skinner Auction will be held online between June 22nd and the 30th. We have reached out to the Morgan Library in New York City. As mentioned in the interview, it has J.P. Morgan's personal papers, and that may include the seller books Joe Hyman referred to. We'll keep you posted on that. And if you want to know just how carbon dating technology is used to determine the approximate age of vintage whiskeys, You can listen to my 2018 interview with Dr. Gordon Cook in episode 747 of WhiskeyCast. It's available in the archives at WhiskeyCast.com. That's WhiskeyCast in depth, brought to you by Oban and the entire Classic Malts lineup. Every sip of Oban is like a postcard. Oban Single Malt Scotch Whiskey is offering the chance to immerse yourself in Oban and the whiskey-making process, through the Oban Abode experience. 
Two winners will receive a trip to Scotland to stay in the Oban Abode, just steps from the distillery. To learn more and enter, visit obanabode.obanwhiskey.com. Complete rules are available at the website. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. We've been doing some spring cleaning around Whiskey Cast Central over the last couple of weeks, and that includes going back through some whiskey samples I had meant to taste a while back, but never quite got around to. That includes the Orphan Barrel Muckety Muck 24-year-old single grain from Diageo, which is the latest release in the Orphan Barrel series. It comes from the old Port Dundas grain distillery in Scotland and was bottled at 45% ABV. The nose is fruity with touches of peaches, red apples, freshly cut grass, and dried flowers. The taste is fruity and tart with peaches, apricots, and red apples, along with a touch of butterscotch and subtle spices that build up slowly, leading into the finish for a nice complexity. That finish is long with those spices, butterscotch, and a touch of vanilla. Older single grains deserve a lot more attention than they usually get. I'm scoring the Orphan Barrel Muckety Muck 24-year-old single grain a 92. Since Saturday was Kentucky Derby Day in Louisville, I opened up a sample of the spring 2021 Old Fitzgerald Bottled in Bond bourbon to taste leading up to the run for the roses. It was distilled back in the spring of 2013 and, of course, is bottled at 50% ABV. The nose screams classic bourbon. Toasted oak, caramel, honey, vanilla, subtle spices, and a hint of cherry pipe tobacco. The taste has good spicy notes of black pepper and cinnamon, complemented by honey, vanilla, black cherries, and dried fruits. The finish? Long, subtle, and well-balanced. I'm scoring the Old Fitzgerald Spring 2021 Bottled in Bond Bourbon a 93. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first. This week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit, the award-winning rye whiskey distillery based in Baltimore, Maryland. Try their signature cask and double oak rye whiskeys, each one a proprietary blend of high and low rye mash bills. Sagamore Spirit has mastered the transformational art of blending. Learn more at sagamorespirit.com and please drink responsibly. I've been saying for years now that when Australia's distillers can get their production up to scale, their whiskies might just take the world by storm. Got more validation of that theory the other day when I had the chance to taste eight different Australian single cask bottlings from that boutique whiskey company, including one from a distillery I hadn't picked up on yet. The Andrews family owns Fleurieu Distillery on South Australia's Fleurieu Peninsula. Fleurier's batch one for that boutique whiskey company is a three-year-old single malt that was matured in a Spanish oak ex sherry cask. It's bottled at 49.5% ABV. The nose is malty with touches of figs, dried fruits, and a hint of earthiness with a beefy character in the background. There is some complexity to this dram. The taste is spicy with clove and cinnamon on top of lemon zest, barley sugar, honey, dried fruits, and a hint of figs. The finish is long and spicy with a hint of meatiness. It's a very substantial dram, and I'm scoring that boutique whiskey company's Fleurier Batch 1 a 93. Last September, we featured Belgrove Distillery founder Peter Bignell in episode 837. It would not be out of character to call him Australian whiskey's mad scientist. He built his entire distillery out of used bits and pieces found on his farm in Tasmania. For instance, he turned an old clothes washer and dryer into a malting drum and has been known to use a certain byproduct from the sheep on his farm to smoke the barley he grows there. He also runs the whole place on used cooking oil from a nearby fish and chips shop. 
His batch one for that boutique whiskey company is a four-year-old rye whiskey bottled at 49.8% ABV. The nose has notes of straw, lemon zest, linseed oil, and a hint of honey. The taste is full of lemon pepper, allspice, and a hint of cinnamon, balanced by honey, straw, and linseed oil with a hint of garden herbs. The finish is long and well-balanced between lingering spices and a lemony tartness. I'm scoring the Bell Grove Rye batch number one for that boutique whiskey company, a 93. Now, the name Lark is legendary in Australian whiskey circles. Bill Lark is regarded as the godfather of Australian whiskey, but his daughter Christy Booth Lark may have an even bigger impact on Australian whiskey over time. She opened Killara Distillery in Tasmania a couple of years ago, and it's Australia's first woman-owned distillery. Her batch number one for that boutique whiskey company actually predates Killara's opening, since it was distilled on her pilot still while the distillery was being built. It was matured for two years in a tawny wine cask, and if you're not familiar with Australian whiskey, two years is the legal minimum in Australia, and tawny is Australia's local version of port wine. It's bottled at 49% ABV. The nose has notes of banana bread, anise, honey, and touches of brown sugar and ginger. The taste is thick and fruity with tangerine, mango, and banana notes, subtle spices, honey, and brown sugar underneath. The finish is long and well-balanced with good baking spices that come alive and complement the fruity character for an amazingly complex dram. Taste it blind, and you will never guess that it's just two years old. I'm scoring that boutique whiskey company's Killara batch number one, a 95. Yes, it is that freaking good. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these whiskeys to our searchable list of more than 3,100 different whiskeys from around the world. Check it out this week at WhiskeyCast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever wondered where Redbreast got its name? Well, let's go back to 1912 and be glad our bird-watching founder didn't spot the bar-tailed godwit that day. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast, Redbreast. Pass it on. It's time to announce our latest Whiskey Club of the Month. On the first episode each month, we pick a whiskey club somewhere in the world to honor as our Club of the Month. And this month, we're honoring the Cask Chasers Club, based in Havre de Grace, Maryland. Dana Bird nominated her club, and here is some of what she said in her email. I'm so humbled by the members of our club and can't believe the people we have connected with, like you, on this adventure. As a cask chaser, we believe that whiskey is meant to be shared and enjoyed, no matter what level of experience you are at in the whiskey world. It builds bridges and friendships, and I am so proud of our group for sticking to its vision of being a safe haven for experienced and novice drinkers alike to come together and share this passion we have for the spirit. I was honored to meet up with the Cask Chasers a couple of years ago for a holiday charity event, and I can speak to that passion. We'll be sending the club two dozen Whiskey Cast Glencairn glasses to use at their upcoming club tastings. Now, if you're in a whiskey club and would like to nominate your club, all you have to do is use the contact form at whiskeycast.com. Tell us a bit about your club, and if your club has a website or a social media presence... We'll be glad to add a link to it on our Whiskey Clubs page at the Whiskey Cast website. Once again, congratulations to the Cask Chasers, our Whiskey Club of the Month for May, and thanks to Glencairn Crystal for helping us support whiskey clubs around the world. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. Lots of comments on our last episode with Matt Hoffman of Westland Distillery on the work they're doing with local farmers to grow barley outside of the so-called commodity system. Benjamin Reed, at Ranger Rick on Twitter, 
posted this in two separate tweets. This week's whiskey cast has been super fascinating. Not only does moving to regional barley varieties make for better and more interesting whiskey, it's also better for the farmers and higher yield. Always love the show, but love it especially when you dig into the nerdy bits. Also appreciate that you consistently bring on a diverse set of guests when it would be easy to just recycle the good old boys club. It is noticed and appreciated. And from Dan Christ, also on Twitter, another great episode of Whiskey Cast. especially loved the interview with Westland Whiskey, re non-commodity barley. This weekend, I posted a photo on social media of a mobile phone tower, really badly disguised as a tree, with about 50 feet of steel pole between the tree line and the tree-like camouflage at the top of the tower. Of course, this must be the textbook example of Kirkus crapius, the species of tree that must be used for maturing some of those laboratory-created Franken-whiskies. I share this not because I thought my joke was really good, but because some of your responses were even better. For instance, from Carl de Hoffman, terrible whiskey, but great for receptions. From James Yoakum, Kirkus Huawei, and have you had the 5G tower barrel-aged one yet, though? Pretty phenomenal. And from tree expert Dr. Tom Kimmerer, oh, it's certainly a conifer, probably a pine. According to my books, it is Pinus cellulam. And after I tried to clear the air on Twitter about the actual price Connor McGregor and his partners received from their sale of proper number 12, nowhere near the $600 million claimed in many mainstream news reports, Greg Butler, at Butler B on Twitter, responded with this. He makes the claim that his Irish whiskey is the number one seller in the world. Clearly, he has taken too many shots to the head. So anything he says should have to be notorious as truth. I mean, his whiskey says whiskey, but tastes like water. Well, I would not go that far. I posted my tasting notes for proper number 12 after it came out, and it is not a bad whiskey. It's just not a great one. And with the real whiskey experts behind the making of it, it could have been much, much better. If there is something that you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. It is rare that a head of state, or in this case a head of state in waiting, takes the time to praise the pleasures of a simple dram of whiskey. Prince Charles, also known in Scotland as the Duke of Rothesay, did just that recently. Twenty-five years ago, he was made an honorary member of the Keepers of the Quake, which honors those who have made significant contributions to the growth of Scotch whiskey. No new Keepers have been inducted since October of 2019, since both of last year's banquets and what would have been this year's spring banquet were all canceled because of the pandemic. But the Prince recorded a special video message for the Keepers on the 25th anniversary of his induction. The Keepers organization released the message this week, and it shows that while he may have a royal title and all that comes with it, Prince Charles is a whiskey lover just like the rest of us. Ladies and gentlemen, I seem to recall it was back in... Uh... 1996, that I first attended the Keepers of the Quake banquet in the splendid setting of Blair Castle in Perthshire, when I was particularly touched and flattered to be inducted as an honorary member of your society. For most of us, uh, who measure time in hours, days and months, a quarter of a century is a long time. But 
For those of you in the Scotch whisky industry who count time to an altogether different beat of years, decades and centuries, it is simply long enough to mature a fine single malt. And now, more than ever, as this dreadful pandemic prevents us from coming together at events uh, such as the Keeper's Banquet or the dinner I hosted for the Society at Dumfries House back in 2016, it is somehow reassuring to think of the spirit of Scotland gently maturing in casks, oblivious to the ebb and flow of world events, waiting patiently to be shared and enjoyed in happier days. It has been, I know, a long, hard winter in Scotland, but as the snow melts in the April sun and flows into the burns and rivers, we take comfort in the knowledge that today's rain is tomorrow's whisky. It is in that spirit of hope for the future that I wanted to address all keepers and masters of the quake, and indeed all members of the extended Scotch whisky family around the world. At its heart, Scotch whisky is the simplest of creations, with just three natural ingredients, water, grain and yeast. Yet, add the alchemy of human knowledge, skill, uh, perseverance and time, and it becomes a product of infinite complexity, depth and significance. From uh, grain to glass, Scotch whisky is in a very palpable sense woven into the very fabric of Scottish society and culture. Its roots run deep into the land, back beyond uh, 1494 when Friar John Cause ate uh, bowls of malt, malt with the first officially recorded evidence of distillation. More than five centuries later, Scotch whisky is firmly established as Scotland's premier export industry, taking the taste of Scotland to virtually every country in the world and generating wealth for communities the length and breadth of the country. With uh, 130 whisky distilleries, Scotland has the largest concentration of distilling infrastructure and expertise of any country in the world. And the great beauty of Scotch whisky is that it is rooted in our rural communities, from the rugged coasts of the Western Isles to the lowlands, the hills of Speyside, and the glens of the Highlands. From uh, the fields of malting barley to the waters of our rivers, to our peatlands and forests, the sustainability of our environment and Scotch whisky go hand in hand. That is why I am so very pleased to see the industry as a whole addressing its responsibility to promote sustainability and the conservation of our natural resources. As we finally rebuild after the pandemic, Scotch whisky also has a vital role to play in the recovery of the hospitality and tourism sectors that are a part of the whisky industry's extended ecosystem and which create priceless economic opportunities for our young people for the future. Scotch whisky is about people, uh, the men and women who make it, who promote it and sell it across the world. And of course, uh, those of us who share it in communal celebration or enjoy it in moments of solitary contemplation. And that is what the Keepers of the Quake represent as a society. All of you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the people who make great Scotch whisky and who make Scotch whisky great. Over its five centuries of uh, often tumultuous history, Scotch whisky has not only survived but has prospered. I have every confidence that the talent and commitment of this extraordinary industry and its people will also prosper in the future. And so, ladies and gentlemen, in the great Scottish tradition of uh, raising a cup of kindness and, uh, for that matter, our spirits during these difficult and often isolated days, it is to you, my fellow keepers and masters of the quake, and indeed everyone 
who contributes to the unique and wonderful elixir that is Scotch whisky, that I offer this toast with a dram from my keeper's quake. And my toast is to the keepers of the quake and all in the Scotch whisky industry, at home and around the world. Slangevar. Special thanks to the Keepers of the Quake for sharing the audio from Prince Charles's message with us. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a rare style of Irish whiskey with a creative twist. A unique, triple distilled blend of single pot still and single malt premium Irish whiskies. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. Do you dare to be creative? That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, cocktail recipes, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes. We love to hear from you. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. This episode of Whiskey Cast is finished. You know, like Dewar's Portuguese Smooth is finished in ruby port barrels. All right, so that wasn't the smoothest segue, but it is remarkably smooth to drink. Curious? Try it. You'll see. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever go out drinking with a peacock? <laughs> Always the same. Few too many. Tail feathers come out. Drinks get knocked over. Bartender's not happy. Night's no, over before it started. All I'm saying is, don't be the peacock in your group. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2021, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.